Hello, everyone. This video is part of my ongoing mini series that I'm calling Lost in Translation. What I'm dealing with are texts from the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, that have generally been mistranslated and therefore misunderstood, misinterpreted, and often read out of context. So it's sort of a whole package deal. And in this particular video, I'm going to talk about the virgin birth of Jesus, the virgin birth of the Messiah, and ask the question, did Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, predict that Jesus would be born of a virgin, or even just that the Messiah would be born of a virgin? We'll go to the Gospel of Matthew, where this is quoted, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and so forth. And the claim is that this is a fulfillment of prophecy, maybe not for Matthew, as we're going to see, the way people take it today, but certainly for millions and millions of conservative or fundamentalist Christians, this is part of the dogma. Remember in the Apostles' Creed and all the other creeds to follow, Nicaea, Chalcedon, and so forth, we find the affirmation that Jesus is conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. And whether this is prophesied or not is the question we want to address. If Isaiah did prophesy that kind of thing, that truly would be quite remarkable, because as far as I know, there's no story anywhere in the Hebrew Bible about a woman becoming pregnant without a man, even births that are considered a wonder or miraculous. For example, the birth of Isaac from Abraham and Sarah is certainly presented in the book of Genesis as miraculous because at the time of Isaac's birth, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, way past the age of childbearing. So that's a miracle, but it's not a virgin birth. Clearly, in the text, Abraham is presented as the father, and that's true throughout the Hebrew Bible. So let's take a look at the text. I know many of you are aware of this, but lots of people aren't. So if you are aware of it, it can be a review for you or just a kind of affirmation of what you understand. Maybe you'll learn something new as well. Okay, so the text we're talking about is Matthew 1, verse 22, and we're breaking into the story here. But if you recall the story, it's very simply and quickly told in the first chapter of Matthew. And the context here in Matthew 1 is that Mary, who becomes the mother of Jesus, is pregnant. She's betrothed or engaged to Joseph. He discovers her pregnancy. He knows he's not the father. And he doesn't want to shame her publicly, but while he's deciding how to handle this situation, because the marriage has been planned by the families, I'm sure, and now his future wife-to-be is pregnant, what's he going to do? An angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, don't fear to take Mary as your wife. Go ahead and marry her, because the baby conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of the Holy Spirit is the idea in the Greek. And then the author of the Gospel of Matthew says in verse 22, to explain to the reader what's going on here, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in the context, the writer of Matthew is essentially saying a woman is going to get pregnant. She's a virgin. The Greek word is parthenos, a woman who's never known a man, never had sexual intercourse, but she's going to get pregnant anyway, and that would fulfill this prophecy. So if we go back to Isaiah 7.14, which is the quotation that you have in Matthew, here's how it reads. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, 
That's the King James Version, often called the Authorized Version from 1611, that many, many people would read and go by. And in fact, if you look at the American Standard Version that was done in 1901, and even the English Authorized Version, which was a revision of the King James that was done in England right at the close of the 19th century, it also reads, a virgin will conceive. So is this a virgin birth, as we call it? Or we should probably call it a virgin conception that would be more accurate, leading to a birth, of course, but a birth from a woman who's never had sexual intercourse, who's never known a man. So what happens? In the 20th century, as more modern translations came out, more scientific, more scholarly, more academic, looking at the Greek text, looking at the context and so forth, when the Revised Standard Version came out, and that would be in 1952, this is translated not as a virgin shall conceive, Isaiah 7, 14, but in Isaiah, it actually reads, as we're going to see below, a young woman shall conceive. I've got a Revised Standard Version right here. I use it all the time. And if I turn to Isaiah 7, 14, it does indeed read, a young woman, and doesn't have the word virgin. So when the RSV came out in 1952, there were book burnings, primarily over this verse and how it was translated in Isaiah 7, verse 14, because conservative Christians insisted that this was the devil's Bible, that the translators were trying to remove the virgin birth. So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at the translation, the Hebrew, as well as the context, and see what we can learn. If we go to Isaiah 7 and begin to pick up the context a little bit, let's read from verse 10 on, and then we'll get to verse 14. We're talking about the king of Judah, or Jerusalem. His name is Ahaz. And this would be in the 600s BCE, the latter decades of the 7th century. Again, the Lord, and that's yod heh vav -Heh, Yahweh or Jehovah. And then the Lord spoke to Ahaz, the king, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. In other words, there's no limit. Think of something that would be utterly astounding. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And then the prophet Isaiah says, Hear then, and he goes ahead and says, Well, you're going to get a sign anyway. Hear then, O house of David, speaking to Ahaz, he's of the line of David and all his household that's of that lineage. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You didn't ask for it, but you're going to get it anyway. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So there it is, the RSV. Burn that Bible because it's taking away the virgin birth. Whereas the King James, behold, a virgin shall conceive. For centuries, people could look that up. And even translations before the King James, like the Geneva Bible, also had a virgin shall conceive. It wasn't controversial because of Matthew quoting it, okay? Now, it goes on to say, let's get a little bit of the context. Verse 15, he, this is the child, the son, he will eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. So as a child is growing up, they eat baby food. That's basically what this is, just milk, curds, and honey. But when a child gets to the point of knowing how to choose good and reject evil, the age of some sort of accountability, it's mentioned in the book of Genesis. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's also mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 39, where Moses is talking about the little children of the ancient Israelite camp who don't yet have a knowledge of good and evil. 
So it doesn't say how old this child is going to be, but the child will get off baby food. And before the child even knows how to refuse evil and choose good, becomes accountable. And, you know, that could be what? 8, 10, 12 years old, maybe a teenager, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Now, here's what happens is people just read this. Behold, a young woman shall conceive, and they sort of freak out because Matthew said, a virgin, and he quotes Isaiah, and Isaiah doesn't have virgin, and the King James has virgin, so everything matches up. And now this evil Revised Standard Version is trying to remove the virgin birth. So two things here. First, the language. What is the word for a young woman? And secondly, what's this about the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted? There's this child is a sign of something in the days of Ahaz, and it has to do with something that's going to happen before the child grows up and gets past childhood, the thing predicted is going to happen. So what is it? Let's start with the language. The terms young woman, maiden, and even in English, virgin, basically all mean the same thing. In Hebrew, the word is alma. It doesn't specifically mean virgin. It means a young woman of marriageable age who, of course, is expected to be a virgin, but it doesn't mean virgin. Now, the Greek word parthenos, everyone will tell you that means virgin, but if you look it up in the best Greek lexicons, again, it's assumed that a virtuous young woman who's going to get married and conceive is going to be a virgin. So it means a young unmarried woman is going to conceive Notice, conceive from a man and bear a son, and here's what you call the child, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the two words, one in Greek and one in Hebrew, actually mean very much the same thing. You can translate it virgin, but in this context of Mary being pregnant without her husband Joseph and not knowing a man, never having slept with or had sex with a man— it obviously emphasizes the virginity part of it, but the word itself is not about being a virgin. It's about being a young woman, a maiden, who is of marriageable age and is, of course, a virgin. But then when she conceives, she's no longer a virgin. That's the context. Now, context is everything, not just the language, but look up 2 Kings 16, and it's even explained in Isaiah 7, so you know what this is all about. Ahaz, king of Judah, 730s BCE, is attacked by two kings. That's why you have the reference to these two kings. And one king is Pekah, king of Israel. That's the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern ten tribes of Israel are attacking Jerusalem and Judea. They are rivals. We read in the book of 2 Kings that Israel makes war with the Jews. Now, how could Israel make war with the Jews? Because Israel back then, in this context at this time, meant the kingdom of Israel ruled by a different king, Pekah, that is not of the Davidic lineage, and a king of Assyria by the name of Rezin that we also know in history. So these two kings have come down in league, and they're going to attack Jerusalem. And Ahaz is terrified that they're going to take the city and obviously kill him and his whole family and maybe take people into exile. It'll be a complete disaster. And Isaiah says, Ask for a sign, and I'll give you a sign about what's going to happen. And then he gives him a sign when he refuses to ask, when he says he doesn't want to tempt God. And what's the sign? It's how this child is going to grow up from infancy, and before he's approaching adulthood and knows the difference between good and evil, you won't even worry about these two kings. They will be gone. And that's exactly what happened. As it says here, the land before whose two kings you're in dread will be deserted. 
so you don't have to worry. So if you read the context and you read the language, young woman, maiden, whether it's Hebrew Alma or Greek Parthenos, it's really better to translate it as young woman because it doesn't specifically mean in either language, Greek or Hebrew, that the woman is going to get pregnant without a man. That is not the meaning, linguistically speaking. The other thing to point out is when Matthew says fulfill, which he does constantly, he talks about an event in the life of Jesus, and then he says this is to fulfill what was written, and then he quotes something from the Hebrew Bible. This is not the way people take fulfilled prophecy today. What it means is something like, this is like that. In other words, let's put it this way. Just as a young woman in the time of Ahaz got pregnant, had a son, and before that son was even weaned, before it even learned to know the difference between good and evil, these kings are going to be gone and you're going to be safe. Believe it, it becomes a sign. And Matthew is saying, that was a saving sign. And now this is a saving sign because this child, Jesus, is going to save his people from their sins. So that's what it actually means. There's another one in chapter two, out of Egypt, I've called my son. That's a quote from Hosea, okay? And it's clearly talking about the nation of Israel, but now it's being applied to Jesus fleeing Egypt because Herod the Great is trying to kill him. And Joseph and Mary take Jesus to Egypt, according to Matthew, to fulfill what was spoken by Hosea. But obviously, Hosea is not talking about Jesus. There's no way. He's talking about ancient Israel coming out of Egypt. So when Joseph and Mary and the young Jesus come back from Egypt, the writer of Matthew says, this fulfilled what was spoken by Hosea, out of Egypt I have called my son. This is like that. Just as that was a sign to Ahaz, this is a sign to you. So next time we'll take another passage, Lost in Translation. I hope this has been helpful. Please share it with people who may not understand this and help them to realize this is not some liberal teaching trying to undermine the faith in the virgin birth, but it's actually a responsible academic historical way to read the ancient languages and the historical context of these passages. And it's superior to misreading them and misapplying them and not really understanding the language. See you next time.